Well, hi everyone. Nice to be here with you. Thanks for inviting me to come talk, even though I'm from Kentucky. I hope you don't hold it against me too much. Um, but it's been really great to be here. And fortunately, I do get to work with Chris Evans uh, on a semi-regular basis. It's always delightful when I do get to. Um, and so at UK, I am their forest health extension specialist. So that means that I deal with trees and their health in a variety of contexts. So whether it's the tree in somebody's yard or the trees in your woods and looking at the things that can impact their health or their health. So insects, diseases, us sometimes doing things we shouldn't do for our poor little trees and how we can manage to promote their health going forward. So today, uh, what uh, Taryn and Chris asked me to talk a little bit about was just some of the common issues that you might see on your trees, particularly some of the insects and diseases that you might see. You know, things that are going wrong on the leaves and the trunks that you might notice and wonder, huh, what is that? Is that a problem? Is that something that's gonna hurt my trees long-term or not really? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. We have so many different diseases and insects because we have like, how many different species of trees do we have? Here, 183. 183, wow. That's even more than I've got in my area. And I think that's enough, but it's, it, so we have a diversity of different trees, which is great because it gives us a lot of buffer room and a lot of wiggle room. Um, but it also means, it means every one of those trees is gonna have their own insects and diseases as well as other things on them. So there are lots, most of these, no big deal. Most of these very minor issues might look bad from time to time, the tree is fine. It's important to be able to distinguish those from things that can impact the health of those trees and woods long-term. So I'm not gonna ask anybody to meditate with me here this morning <laughs> or this afternoon and <laughs> imagine a tree, but imagine a tree in your mind, or you can just look at this picture of one if that, if that feels too much for right after lunch. Um, imagine a tree and the different parts of that tree. You know, you've got your leaves and your canopy, you've got the branches, you've got the trunk, and then what you can't see below ground but is essential to that tree, the root and everything having to do with that. Now, all of those are essential for the tree, but they're also all places where kind of things can go wrong, where you can have insects and diseases that can cause problems. So when you're trying to figure out what's happening, the most important thing I think for you to do is to correctly identify what the problem is. So you might see something looking funny in the leaves, but figuring out what that is will tell you, well, is the problem really in the leaves or is its root, no pun intended, somewhere else? Is the cause of the problem elsewhere in the tree? And so I think that maybe today's presentation, hopefully will give you some visuals for some of the common things you might see um, both those that are no major issue, as well as those that can cause bigger problems down the road. So I'm going to go through it with different parts of the tree, talk about some things that impact leaves, some things that might impact the trunk and the vascular system of the tree, which is that key part of the tree in that trunk that is involved in all of the moving around of water and resources, or the roots and base of the tree. What are some common issues with each one of those? Because I imagine you're gonna see your tree and those are the different places you're gonna be looking. So leaf issues. There are so many different leaf issues and ways in which leaves can look ratty, especially starting this time of year, going into late summer. Uh, you might see a lot of leaves that look kind of beat up. The good news is that the majority of these leaf issues are not a big deal for your trees. Trees support lots of different insects, lots of insects gonna feed on them. For the most part, the trees are gonna recover just fine. So I'm gonna walk through a few of those and you'll have to excuse that bar at the top, but I'll walk through. So one of the common issues that you'll see are skeletonizers. Insects that are gonna basically leave the skeleton of the leaf still there, but eat all the juicy green stuff. Those of you who were out with us this morning, we saw plenty of that, right? 
it kind of looked like the, the thin shell of the leaf was left. And a lot of times what that is, is you've got some kind of insect, in this case, a sawfly larvae. This is the scarlet oak sawfly, a common skeletonizer in our area. And you can see what it's doing. It's eating all of the juicy green stuff and leaving kind of the harder fibrous veins of that leaf. Is that going to hurt the tree long-term? No. No, why not? It doesn't have a big enough impact. It doesn't have a big enough impact. It's going to feed a little bit, a couple patches here and there on leaves for the most part. The trees are resilient and won't even notice this. Um, maybe some years you could wind up with a major outbreak locally, just in a little pocket of something like this oak saw fly, where it looks like all of your tree's leaves are brown. And you might initially think, oh no, all my trees are dying. But if what you look is, you look up close and you see instead the skeletonizing pattern, you can kind of breathe easy and that those trees aren't actually dead, they've just had some insect damage and they'll bounce back just fine next year. So an example of that, this is a photo a couple years ago. You can see it looks like all of the trees have turned brown and died in the middle of summer. But if you look a little more closely, you'll see these are shingle oaks and you see the brown isn't actually like a dead leaf on that tree. It's that something has eaten all of the green parts of those leaves. And if you look a little bit more closely, you might even see this little larva right here, which belongs to the shingle oak skeletonizer. Again, it might look really bad at a distance, but when you look up close, you're gonna see that it's not as bad as it seemed. Both of these very common, not something that's gonna hurt your tree long-term. There are lots of other ways that insects can eat the leaves, right? They might just eat them less selectively, like a caterpillar going through and eating all of the foliage. This is a forest tent caterpillar. Have you seen tent caterpillars before? Yes. Do they kill our trees? No, you probably haven't even noticed. You might notice the tents, they look kind of unsightly. They might defoliate the trees, which is the name for when those caterpillars eat all the leaves off of those trees. And the trees probably bounce back just fine. Now, here's kind of a forest where this has happened at a large scale. And you can't quite see it, but those trees have been completely, you know, all of their leaves have been eaten. But this is a rare occurrence and something that's only going to happen, you know, once in a blue moon. And then those trees are going to bounce back from that. If this happened year after year after year, however, those trees would really struggle. But if this happens year after year, those trees can become really stressed. And our natives typically don't do this. We do have a few different native, you know, defoliating insects, but it tends to be pretty small. But we do have some invasive insects that are on the horizon that could do that at a broader scale and be more problematic um, that we could talk about like spongy moth. So another thing that I know you all have seen because I've already been talking with you and this has come up are galls. Galls are any, it's just a general catch-all term for any abnormal growth or swelling. So like a tumor on your tree basically. And they can come in lots of different shapes and sizes. You might get some that are just tiny little things on the leaf. You might get some larger ones like these oak apple galls that really stand out. This is one that I know you all have been getting a lot of, a jumping oak gall. It can cause the whole canopy to look almost brown. But then when you look up close, it's not that the trees themselves, the leaves themselves have died, it's just they're covered with these tiny, tiny little galls on the underside. All of the galls that I'm showing in this picture, these pictures here, are caused by insects. So the insect is using this tree to reproduce. And oaks in particular have so many different insects that live on them. And we can have so many different galls. For the most part, these galls don't really hurt the tree at all, especially these galls that just impact the leaves. Down here, you might lose some leaves here or there. You might have some years where, you know, it might more significantly impact things. Long term, your trees are going to be just fine. There are some other types of galls, though, like 
that horned oak gall, or maybe like these gabby oak galls that I know <laughs> several of you are dealing with as well. And they're a little different. You know, this is not on the leaf. This is on the shoots, on the twigs. And if it was just one or two of these galls, nobody cares. Your tree is just fine. What is happening here is that there's a tiny little wasp. It lays its eggs here. And various hormones that are created by that process cause the tree to actually produce this big swollen growth and swelling. One of the problems, though, is that it can kill the new shoot that is just beyond that. So not only does it look kind of bad, it looks like your tree is full of these weird growths, but it can kill that new shoot growth, which again, if you just have one or two branches with this, no big deal. So if I see a tree that is totally covered, like this poor little tree in a parking lot that has a drainage ditch next to it and cars all over it and gravel everywhere, this is a stress. This tree has some challenges in its life um, and it's completely covered with this gall. Um, most of the time, I tend to think of that gall as being a problem for stress trees or for young trees. Let's say you have a whole bunch of really young trees that you want to have nice form and they get this gall and they have, you know, worse form because of that. It might not matter right now, but down the road when you want to have big profitable timber trees, it could be a bigger problem. Um, as well as if you have a low diversity of tree species, which, as we just heard, is not as big of a problem in our woodlands that can be in our urban or landscape settings. Um, but this is kind of a, the exception to the rule that galls in general might be eye-catching and, and look bad, but aren't really as big of a deal. This is one gall that you might see more of. And then the question is, well, what would you do about it if you had this gall? And my reaction would be that one or two galls is no problem. So I might prune it out of my tree if I had one or two, but typically it's not one or two by the time I hear about it, it's a whole tree full of it. And uh, you know, you could get rid of that if you don't want it to spread to your other trees, uh, try to sanitize. But you could also think about why is my tree so stressed that it's covered with all these galls and what could I do to promote the health of those, those trees? So another kind of common issue that I see kind of in that canopy of trees is a fungal disease called anthracnose. And on our morning walk, our morning tour, someone mentioned the name anthracnose sounds really you know, nefarious. It sounds like it's up to no good with a name like anthracnose. Um, but anthracnose is really just a common name for a fungal uh, kind of leaf death. So you have dead patches of tissue on your leaves. And if you can look in this picture, this should be a really full canopy of a sycamore tree. Instead, it's really thin. You can see a lot of the leaves are too small and kind of shriveled up. And what's going on is you've got this fungal foliar problem where you've got um, the fungus kind of living in there, killing that tissue. Anthracnose is just one of many different fungal foliar issues. We could spend all day here talking about the different weird things that cause dead patches on your leaves, which I don't think anybody really wants to do. I mean, maybe you're passionate about tiny, tiny fungi and leaves, but if you're not, there, there are lots and lots of different ones, most of which don't really hurt the health of the tree, with a few exceptions. However, these fungal foliar issues tend to be really driven by the weather. So in years where we have kind of cool, wet springs, you can expect to see a lot more anthracnose than if you have dry weather. Because the way that fungus reproduces, it needs to have those wet conditions when it's getting those spores out there so it can infect new tissue. If you don't have those conducive weather conditions, you might have little pockets of it here and there. Not gonna be a big deal. That explains why some years, you can have years where the entire canopy of your sycamore might look like it's all you know, dead and dying. Typically what happens in that case is that tree will drop those leaves and put out a new flush of them. Um, now sycamore can do that and some species can do that, but some species are very reluctant to do that. So oaks, you'll see oaks with anthracnose when we saw some this morning. Um, it's gonna retain those leaves and they're just gonna look ratty 
and they're going to continue looking ratty through the rest of the summer, uh, but they'll photosynthesize and, and continue producing energy for those trees. Now, where anthracnose and other kind of fungal issues like this can become a problem is when they move from those leaves into the shoots of the tree. So I mentioned earlier the problem with those oak galls, one of them being that it killed that new shoot growth. You don't want to kill the new growth of your tree, right? That's it putting on that kind of new tissue that you want to see. So if that fungus is then moving into the shoots and causing damage that way, killing that new growth, killing those branches, eventually can move into the trunk and cause problems there, uh, it makes anthracnose a bigger deal. And that really only happens for a couple of different species. That's going to be sycamore and dogwood, where if you have the right conditions, you've got a spot that's holding moisture, and you've got these, the fungus that's there and the weather that's right, you can get a lot of disease uh, problems that way. And that might just be a thing to think about, is that the best place for that species given all the disease issues it's having? Um, so you can kind of see some more here how it's moved into the branches and it's causing some cankers, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and this is a picture of what it might look like, a spot anthracnose on a dogwood. I'm sure you've seen this before. And you can treat your landscape dogwood with fungicide to help protect them from some of this disease. Now, obviously, that's not really going to help you in your woods. <laughs> You're not going to be out there spraying all your trees for this. Um, but in a landscape setting, there are some options, as well as resistant cultivars. So you can purchase that won't get these diseases as much. Um, and if not, you might see some, some death in your dogwood and in your sycamore due to these problems. And there's so many more. Again, we could talk all day about the weird things that you find on leaves that caused by fungi and insects. This is maple tar spot. It is everywhere. It is very common. It looks terrible and it really doesn't hurt the trees at all. Did you? But I also want to point this out because Sometimes leaf issues can be very misleading. So this is one that in my area we have a ton of called bacterial leaf scorch. And the name scorch is because the leaves look like they've been scorched from the outside edges in, right? It looks like those leaves got too close to a campfire and have crisped up from those outside edges in. Um, but what's really happening there has nothing to do with the leaf. The leaf is where you're seeing the symptoms, but the actual problem is in a very different part of the tree. It's in that trunk. It's in that vascular system of the tree. And what you're seeing here is not problems on the leaves. It's the fact that that tree has no water. So it's an extreme sudden drought for that tree, basically. And so it's drying out. Um, so these leaf symptoms, sometimes it might look like it's a leaf, but it's actually some other part of the plant. And another kind of example of that is this is a tree that I, I don't know if you can tell, but the canopy is really thinning. It's got a lot of brown leaves and dead branches. You can see that the tips have been dying and declining over time. So the leaves look bad. But the real problem is, and I can tell this each fall when the mushrooms fruit out from the base of the tree, is that tree has extensive root rot. Its roots are very compromised. It's got tons and tons of mushrooms spreading out of it, which tells me that the roots are not in great condition. And I think that that tree is not getting enough water. So I might see the problems in the leaves, but they're actually kind of happening in that root system. Um, so let's talk a little bit and move into that trunk and that vascular system of the tree. And the trunk you know, of a tree does many different things for that tree. Uh, not only is it the part that's most valuable from a timber perspective and structurally holding the tree up. But just under that bark is the vascular system of the tree, the phloem, the xylem, and all that good stuff that is essential for that tree to survive, to move around water and energy and nutrients. Um, and so there are some different insects and diseases that the way that they hurt trees is by impacting the trunk or simply that vascular system, just that area kind of under the bark that is important in those processes. And that alone can hurt trees. So, uh, you know, the most obvious example of that right now that we're dealing with is the emerald ash borer. Now, it's an invasive beetle that has larvae that tunnel 
just under the bark in this kind of juicy part of the tree. And if it was one little larva, it would be no problem. But there are hundreds, thousands of larvae that can attack a tree and basically girdle it from the inside, strangle it and cut off its circulation from the inside. They don't go into the wood at all. They stay in kind of that outer part, but the damage there alone is enough to rapidly kill ash trees. Um, so there are lots of other wood borers out there, but I think that this emerald ash borer is just one that in our area right now is just at the forefront of kind of wood borers that are causing tree death. And something that those trees, they don't have defenses to, they can't recover from. So from kind of that spectrum of how important is this for the tree's health, very important, a very big deal. And so if you're looking for wood borers, what are some things you might see? Well, most of the time you don't have the bark peeled off like that, so you can't really see their tunneling as clearly, but you might see maybe some holes in the bark, maybe. A lot of the time, by the time you see that, things are pretty far advanced. You might see some tunneling. You might get lucky and see, you know, an, a beetle emerging or a larva. Most of these wood borers are going to be uh, beetles who, as larvae, are going to be doing that tunneling. Um, but that's pretty rare. Most of the time, they're going to be hidden from our view because they're inside of the tree. So instead, what you're going to see is a kind of ratty looking canopy, right? You're going to see dead branches. Uh, loss of leaves, decline over time. What you're not seeing is that inside that trunk, you've got a lot of damage that's being caused by that tunneling. Now, not everything that tunnels in a tree is going to kill it. We have many wood borers that are not going to be uh, as damaging for the health of the tree. But the emerald ash borer is one that is killing, rapidly killing green ash, white ash, and other ash species. Um, and that's because our trees don't really have defenses to them. You know, it's an invasive insect, it's from Asia. In Asia, it doesn't cause these kinds of problems on the ash they have there. But when it gets here, it finds a tree that is unable to defend itself from the emerald ash borer. And if you wanna talk more about emerald ash borer, we can, um, but I know that you have other presentations coming up in the near future, all about emerald ash borer, is that right? Right, yeah. Right, so stay tuned for more information. But there are others, there are other native wood borers that typically cause fewer problems <laughs> And there are other invasive wood borers. So this is one that you all no longer have in the state of Illinois because it has been successfully eradicated. But this is another invasive wood borer, the Asian longhorn beetle that is huge. The beetle is like as large as your thumb and has these huge larvae that will tunnel inside of trees. Not only is that gonna impact that vascular system that we talked about, but the whole integrity of the tree when you have something that large tunneling around in it. Um, and when this is found, it is kind of, tr we try to eradicate it as quick as possible because it impacts maples as well as a wide range of other tree species and would be incredibly destructive if it were allowed to establish here. Um, so in addition to those kind of wood borers, you have a wide range of what are called bark and ambrosia beetles. Uh, and I wanted to show this picture because these holes are probably each about the size of a pencil lead, you know, something really tiny, but you might see, especially on old logs, dead branches, dead trees, just tons and tons of these holes. Have you seen this before? Um, anything's declining, lots and lots of them. And there are different kind of insects, again, both a range of native and non-native insects that can do this. You might also look for what are called toothpicks or frass tubes. It looks like somebody poked a toothpick into a tree, uh, but it's actually just the frass, which is a fancy word for the poop of the insect. And it's kind of wood shavings that it's created and it's tunneling, uh, poking out from that. You might see, if you were to look closely, some tunneling inside of a tree and then this is the beetle itself, or un-ambrosia beetle, one single one. This is very tiny, right? <laughs> you would not notice this typically. These are quite small, um, but there are lots of them. Mostly, when I think of ambrosia beetles, I think of things that impact stress trees. 
trees that are already having some health issues. There are a few exceptions, um, and we'll all talk about one of those in just a minute. So from there, I want to move into cankers and talk a little bit about some of the fungi and diseases that can impact the vascular system of trees. So cankers are diseases in that vascular system, the phloem and cambium. You can see them on stems, branches, and twigs. You can see this dead patch on this twig. The important thing to note about it is a dead part is the part of the tree that it needs to survive and live. Not necessarily the wood part of it, but the part of it that's actively moving things around. Typically, these progress over time, and there can be many different causes. They can be caused by wounding. They can be caused by fungi, other things, many different types. So just to kind of show a couple of examples here, you can see this dark black anchor. That's if you've peeled away, you might not notice it until you've peeled away the bark. And then you see that what's happening underneath the bark is the growth of this fungus that's degrading the woody tissue. And then in this picture, you can see this big swelling. And what's happened there is that over time, the fungus grows a little bit and hurts the tree, but then the tree is actively fighting that fungus and it's putting on new growth, trying to seal it out. So sometimes you can get these really gnarly looks to these cankers that are caused by that arms race between whatever pathogen is causing the disease and the plant. This is a common canker, a nectria canker here. And you might not notice it most of the time. You might just have slightly sunken bark. The fungus is in there living in the tree. Um, but then it might sporulate around those branch rings. And by sporulate, I mean this is a fungus. And that's how it's reproducing. It's basically these are the tiniest of tiny little mushrooms that it's trying to get spores out to infect new trees. And when it does that, it has this bright orange color. This is something that I would prune out of my tree if it were a landscape tree. I would try to have the best possible uh, pruning cuts to prevent those from being infected by this particular pathogen and causing more damage, but not necessarily something that I think of as being, you know, really lethal to trees. More something that's going to cause this branch die back um, and decay over time. There are lots of different types. And if you ever see something like this in your woods and wonder what is going on there, why does it have this target shape? Probably what's happening is you have whatever has caused this tanker, this fungus that's in there, and it's growing and it's trying to attack the tree. And the tree is growing and it's trying to wall it off. And they do that year after year. So this is probably, we can count the tree rings but many years of this kind of growth of a tree trying to defend itself and the fungus trying to attack it. Um, another very common canker that you'll see, especially associated with stressed oak trees, is what's called hypoxylum canker, or by its new name, which just rolls off the tongue, viscognioxia canker. Um, and you might not notice too much, but if you look up in the canopies of trees, that are stressed and declining, this kind of uh, gray or black smooth patch um, is a sign that inside that tree, you have a fungus growing that is attacking that tree and causing it to decline little by little. I see this most common with trees that are, you know, have root issues or other things going on. And this is kind of like a nail in the coffin that can cause problems uh, and maybe take that tree out, but not be the root of that problem. Um, you'll also see this though on your, you know, dead logs. If you, does anybody grow shiitake in them? If you try to grow shiitake and you let your logs get too dry, you will instead grow hypoxylum canker. <laughs> At least I have several times <laughs> and it's very disappointing, um, but it's already present in that tree and just kind of waiting for those right conditions to take off and grow. You might also see what are called bleeding cankers, like oozing black spots on your trees. Now, sometimes that's just caused by wounding or some minor thing, but sometimes those are caused by pathogens that are growing under the bark of those trees. And you might never see them, right? Because they're under the bark. 
but occasionally you might see the oozing response that's both the fungus in there, but also the tree trying to defend itself against that fungus, because our trees are far from helpless against some of these things. Um, so if you notice some of these bleeding cankers, uh, there are different things that can cause those. Uh, there are many phytophthora cankers, and there are some treatments that you could do in kind of a landscape setting. Again, not gonna be worth the money to do that in your woods, but something you might see nonetheless. All right, kind of connected to cankers are wilts. And wilts are kind of another symptom. Wilt describes what's happening with the tree. No surprises, it's looking wilty. Your leaves are wilty. Your branches are wilty. They look like they don't have enough water. And that's because they don't have enough water. Wilts are caused by a lack of water in that tree. Something is cutting off that flow of water. Now, there's lots of different things. You could get a wilty tree because it's been droughty and it does not have enough water. Um, you could get a wilty tree because there's a pathogen living inside that tree's, you know, vascular system cutting off the flow of water. Their hot and dry weather can result in those wilty symptoms. And of course, you want to distinguish which one it is so that you're not worried about some disease when it's actually just the weather or you don't miss something that's very important. So I think one of our most you know, famous wilts is gonna be Dutch elm disease, which is caused by a fungus that is transmitted by beetles and causes elm tree death and decline. Um, but some of the things about it, I think are just good examples of what wilts do. So you might start out with your upper branches turning yellow, losing kind of they're bigger, defoliating, so the leaves drop. And those symptoms move from the top down to the bottom of the tree. And then over time, you might have an entire branch die, and then the entire tree die. So it progresses over time. And that's going to be pretty common a lot of times for these various wilt diseases. So you might see the foliar issues. You might see what's happening in the tree here, but the actual cause of that is going to be in that trunk that you can't really see kind of outside of where you're going to view. And the cause of that is going to be this fungus. You see this black staining right around the edge there? That's going to be that fungus that is clogging things up as well as the tree trying to defend itself. And that fungus is moved around by these tiny beetles from tree to tree. Um, so the perfect system for it to get around and find its next dinner, not so good for us. There are all, lots of other wilts though, lots of other fungi that can operate in the same way. Dutch elm disease is probably the best known one because it just wiped out elms when it was introduced. It's an invasive species that continues to cause problems here, but there's verticillium wilt, which is especially a problem in landscape settings. And here you can kind of see that same thing. The trees looking, it's got all of these leaves that are still attached to it, uh, dead and dried out on the, the canopy still. You've got this black staining inside of the twig when you cut it open. That's the fungus in there clogging things up. We have oak wilt, which is very important uh, in this area as well as throughout uh, much of the Midwest. And you can see those same symptoms. We saw the verticillium wilt earlier with the tree that had all of the leaves on it that were still attached, but had turned brown and died. That's also a classic um, oak wilt uh, symptom. And part of the reason for that is that that death is so rapid. After a tree is infected with oak wilt, how long, how fast can it kill a red oak? One to three months. One to three months. Yeah, so the tree might not even see it coming. You know, it just suddenly doesn't have any water. Those leaves were not prepared for it. They can't kind of drop off in the proper pattern and they just die on that tree. Uh, and if you were to look at it, they might, you might think it's a leaf issue, right? Because those leaves might have that same scorch. I showed you a picture of that bacterial leaf scorch earlier. It's actually the same kind of thing that's happening with bacterial leaf scorch in that the symptom might be in the leaf, but what's actually happening is that fungus that's clogging up the flow of water and preventing the tree from having access to water. 
Um, and kind of another symptom of oak wilt that you might find is if you have oak wilt and there are kind of uh, cracks in the bark or patches under the bark where it's split, um, that's going to be where the fungus that causes it reproduces and it makes these mats of hyphae, which is the name for the fungal body and the spores, it's mushrooms, and it's sticky and sweet and it attracts beetles that will then go in there and then carry it to new trees. So another feature of oak wilt. And this is just kind of a map of where oak wilt is. So you can see, while it is not terribly common in Illinois, it is present throughout the area. A major issue for oaks, particularly red oaks, and particularly those oaks that are already stressed. And this is something that it has those beetles that can move it around, as I mentioned. It can also be moved around tree to tree through natural root connections that trees make underground or by us accidentally moving it around through pruning equipment that's contaminated from tree to tree, um, perhaps creating pruning cuts the wrong time of year that would allow those spores to arrive, reach there and infect those new cuts. Um, so another kind of vascular issue for trees, yeah. Did you say it's not particularly common in Illinois? Uh, it is present throughout, but not as common of an issue. Um, so do you want to describe kind of how frequently do you see this? Yeah, so it's widespread, but oftentimes, you know, I'll see two or three cases a year or something people call about it. So it's not going to be like everywhere, but, um, but it's, it's around. Yeah. And if you have something like a drought, that would be a perfect triggering event for those trees to be stressed. You can see a lot more of it following that in the years kind of following up to a drought or a defoliation event or something. Despite this map saying that it is present throughout Kentucky, I have never seen it. I've never talked to anybody in our state who has seen it. So I think this map might be a bit of an exaggeration. Anything else kind of in addition to avoiding pruning during avoiding pruning oaks during the summertime to reduce the chances of spreading it? Are there other things you'd like folks to know about that? The, the big thing is if you think you have it is to try to get it identified right away and then remove those trees, right? So as they're dying, they have those fungal spores that Ellen talked about and that can attract those beetles. So cutting those trees out and basically stopping that spread quickly is, is the key. So another kind of similar but different disease that I wanted to mention is one. So you just mentioned oak wilt, which you have, and I, I fortunately don't have to deal with in Kentucky. But this is one that I have to deal with in Kentucky that you all fortunately do not yet have to deal with. And that is laurel wilt disease, which is a very kind of similar disease, but it's a new invasive species that we just detected in the area a couple of years ago, native to Asia. And it kills sassafras trees and can rapidly kill sassafras trees. Um, and I want you to be on the lookout for this. And if you see patches of dead sassafras trees, or if you see any of these symptoms, you can call Chris <laughs> or, <laughs> or go your, to your county account. office. And what to look for is that it's a wilt. So I mentioned, you know, what does wilt mean? It's wilty, it's droopy. So this time of year, the leaves on your sassafras just looking kind of wilty, not looking so good, maybe a little discoloration. A little bit later in the summer, you might see early fall color. Sassafras has beautiful fall color, reds and oranges, but if you see that kind of late summer, it is not normal. It's a kind of a, a, a cause for concern. Uh, you might see sassafras that still have their leaves attached, but the leaves are all dead and shriveled up on the canopy, or just a lot of dead sassafras. Um, one of the ways I've been looking for it is just driving along the road and seeing dead sassafras, um, where it likes to grow right there in the fence rows along the side of the road. Um, so here are some leaves with early fall color. This was, I think, in August, um, far earlier than they should have been for our area, and just lots of dead sassafras. And then if you were to cut into the bark of those trees, uh, what you'd see is again, you know, that black staining that I've shown for some others, for laurel wilt disease, it is 
super distinctive. It is like black streaky staining just under the bark of that tree growing in that vascular system, cutting off the water and killing the tree that way. As well as the tree desperately trying to defend itself from it by cutting off its own flow of water and it does not make the situation better. So here you can kind of see that black ring all the way around that stem as well as there. If you see this, it is very conclusive um, kind of evidence of laurel wilt disease. There are some other things like I showed you with the Bersillium wilt that can kind of cause that staining under the bark, but nowhere near as black and streaky as this one. So again, this is another fungal pathogen that's being spread around by a beetle. In this case, both the pathogen, the fungus that causes it, and the beetle are native to Asia. There, they're attracted to kind of stressed trees. The beetle is one of those ambrosia beetles that I mentioned earlier, those tiny, tiny little beetles that cause lots of holes in trees. And ambrosia beetles are what are called fungus farmers. They intentionally bring fungi with them when they tunnel in trees, and then they'll eat the fungus that grows there. And typically that fungus stays isolated to where they're tunneling, and it's only attracted to trees and branches that are kind of stressed anyways. But this is native to Asia, and it comes here to North America, and everything is kind of out of whack. Here, this little tiny beetle that causes holes that are this size, this is my thumb for reference, so you can see how tiny they are, um, is attracted to very large, healthy sassafras, and will attack them. And the fungus spreads out into the tree and can kill it. So a very kind of unusual situation, but classic with what we see with these invasives, our trees don't have defenses for them and are killed by them. These are those toothpicks I mentioned earlier that ambrosia beetles will produce. Um, so just a kind of another, if I, if I see this on a sassafras, I immediately have a little bit of concern. There are other ambrosia beetles that can attack sassafras, but I'm always on the lookout for this one. And now you all can be too in this area. And this is just the tiny, tiny beetle that causes it. Are you ever going to see this beetle? No, it's like, it's so small, but that's what's kind of moving it around. And kind of another point, this is where the flora wilt disease is known to occur. All the counties that have bright colors. It's been in this kind of Gulf Coast and Atlantic area since the early, you know, 2000s, but then jumped up here into Southern Kentucky, uh, up to the Louisville area just a couple years ago. Now those little beetles, while they are flyers, they're not gonna fly by themselves all the way up here to Kentucky. That's, a, that's an awfully long journey for that tiny little beetle. No, undoubtedly this came in on uh, contaminated firewood. I would bet somebody just had some firewood that had the beetle from further south, moved it up accidentally. How would you ever know that it had these tiny little beetles in it? You know, they're too small to see. So it's so easy to accidentally move things around uh, that you're not intending to, especially uh, insects and diseases on firewood. So I think just an example of why not doing that is significant because they did not get to, to Kentucky uh, on their own. So to kind of wrap us up, I just want to mention some of the common issues you might see on the roots and on the base of trees. So while there are many different things that can cause problems that you might see there, the most common one are rots. When you think of what are you going to see, most of that's going to be underground. And most of those things are going to be things decaying the roots and the base of those trees. By and large, these are fungi. Fungi are the things that decay wood, and they can decay wood all over the place. So while I'm talking about root and the base of the tree, the butt of the tree, which is the most valuable part of the tree from a timber perspective, so if that's where you have rot, it is very significant because that is the part that you want to be valuable. They can come in from the top of the tree. You can have top rot. Let's say you had an ice storm or a windstorm that broke out some canopies. You can have rot that comes in from there. You can have heart rot if you had some wounding that opened up kind of an entry point for those fungi to get into the wood of your tree. Um, there's lots of different rots that are out there from things that are going to impact the roots where you might get more tip overs of trees to things that might affect the base of the tree or the wood of it 
result in more likelihood of it snapping uh, to things like this up at the top of the tree where the canopy was lost and you have fungi that are moving in on that wounded wood. Many, many, many different species of fungi can cause rot. And there's a lot of overlap between those that can attack healthy trees and those that just decay dead stuff. As far as those fungi are concerned, the inside of the tree is pretty much like a log. So if it manages to get in there, it will cause rot. Now, most of the time, the bark is really good at keeping those fungi out of the tree. But if for some reason the bark is gone, like you know, you have an ice storm or you nick a tree with your weed whacker or whatever, um, those fungi can get in and cause problems. Uh, so some of them aggressive pathogen, most are going to be kind of in this weak pathogens or, or just breaking down dead material zone. And they act opportunistically. So they will take advantage of stress and run with it. Um, so this is just a picture of kind of from a timber perspective, why is this a problem? So this is a tree that is growing great. No problems really from the outside except of this tiny little wounded spot right here at the base, a little bit of cat facing. But then if you were to cut it open, what you would see is that whenever this was wounded, like 20 years ago, um, it let decay fungi into this tree. And those have been inside of the tree, eating and you know having the time of their lives since then. The tree has continued to grow and just been fine, putting on new growth and kind of walled it off. But it hasn't, it's not going to be able to get rid of it once it's in there. So if you are trying to sell this, how valuable is this going to be? Zero right now. <laughs> sound. I mean, for the tree might continue to grow and be perfectly happy for a long time, but you would be in for a, a rude surprise when you tried to get some money for that because it is no, no value here. Now, similarly, from another perspective, if this tree was growing right next to your house, how would you feel about that? Huh? Yeah. Not good? Scared? Maybe? Maybe it'd be okay, but it is also a little uncomfortable there. So both kind of from a timber perspective and a risk perspective, <clears throat> something you want to know about. So this is a house in my neighborhood after a uh, windstorm. And you can see what happened. They had a really old uh, pin oak that had been declining for many years due to a variety of factors. But what they also had was the entire inside is hollow. There are actually mushrooms on the inside of the tree that were fruiting. And when it fell over onto their house, um, you can see that that was very decayed. So an issue from a structural perspective, as well as for the health of that tree. Um, so there are lots of fungi that cause this, but a few of the most common ones that I, when I see these, I'm like, oh, you've got some root rot issues would be things like armillaria root rot. Now, occasionally it produces mushrooms. You might know them as honey mushrooms. Um, now, that's just going to be a late summer kind of deal. And if it doesn't happen to be late summer, uh, you're not going to see that. But it also produces these hardened fungal structures called rhizomorphs or shoestrings. That gives it the name shoestring root rot. Um, if you're seeing these, you have armillaria fungi decaying wood. Is it a bad thing? This is a normal part. If, if wood didn't decay, it would just accumulate in our woods and it'd be full of wood, right? This is will attack a log just perfectly happy, but it will also attack the base of trees, especially those that are stressed. So here's some others, Ganoderma. Uh, you have probably seen things that kind of look like this before. Shelts, they're very hard. Um, uh, this, the fungus that causes these, these are its mushrooms, or as close as it's going to get to them, and they're everywhere. But this can cause you know, disease and decay on roots of trees. I don't know if you can see in this photo, but this is on a construction site where the tree had been dinged a lot of the base and the soil very compacted by equipment, and there are lots of mushrooms growing out of it. And I'm thinking, well, they should have just taken this whole tree out when they did this construction. If they weren't going to take care of it, they might as well just cut the tree down and planted a new one when they were done, because that tree is going to die in the near future anyways. Um, but you'll find these all the time in kind of a woodland setting as well. Now, is it a major issue? Is that tree going to immediately die? 
oh, probably that should be fine. Um, definitely tells you there's some decay happening in there though. So if you're again, trying to maximize timber production, you see a lot of fungal fruiting bodies coming from the base of your tree, no matter what they are, it's not a good sign. There are lots of others um, from heart rocks like this one of ash, very, very common post emerald ash borer. After emerald ash borer kills the tree, I see a lot of this ash heart rot and many others. Um, and I just wanted to throw this in here too, because sometimes you'll see mushrooms coming from a tree or fruiting out of the base of a tree. And the, the kind of immediate thought is like, that's killing my tree, that's causing the problem. But a lot of times, those might be fungi that just break down dead material. So they're there, they tell you there's a dead pocket in that tree and there's rot happening, but they might not be the one that's actually driving things. It might be something else. They're just taking advantage of those conditions. This is an oyster mushroom. Oyster mushrooms are not thought of as pathogens. They'll happily break down dead wood all day though. So if you see them coming from a tree, it tells you there's a lot of decay going on in there. It's not because of that fungus, but something else is happening there that, that caused it. Um, another question I get with fungi and mushrooms is, well, how can I get rid of them? If you know there's mushrooms coming out of somebody's your tree, uh, can I spray it with a fungicide to get rid of them? And unfortunately, you can't really. There's not gonna be an effective way to stop wood decay in a tree once it's started. The best thing you can be doing is promoting the health of your tree going forward so that it puts on a lot of new growth and is healthy and you can kind of extend its life that way. You can't really get at the fungus that is causing that decay because the part of the tree that it's growing in is dead already. So there's nothing, there's not a good vehicle to get that fungicide to it, to kill it. And this is just a picture of <laughs> a tree I saw. And I, I like this tree because this tree, is, it, it was well on its way to being dead then, um, but it doesn't matter if this tree had like things in the canopy and you know disease on its leaves or insects or fruit bodies. There's no way this tree is going to survive. This tree has been paved in, has no rooting zone. Um, I'm sure is constant damage. Um, so this poor tree, again, another situation where perhaps it would have been best to just get rid of that tree or to protect it better because little stresses add up in trees, whether you're in a parking lot or in the woods. And if you have lots and lots of compounding stresses, all of a sudden the things that weren't a big deal to, at first to a tree that's healthy and can defend itself become a very big deal. Um, so you can get declines and other things that result from that. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up and hopefully we have time for a little bit of questions. Um, some of the most common issues that I see, not all of these are the things that cause the death of trees, right? Many of these are things that don't really hurt trees at all, but you might notice them and be concerned about them. And now you can tell your neighbor the next time that they bring you some leaves that have some skeletonizers on them, like, oh, that's okay, that's gonna be fine, versus when they should bring a sample to the diagnostic lab um, to determine whether it's oak wilt or not. Um, so a lot of times, what you want to have when you're dealing with forest health is this like really robust toolbox. And we do have a lot of tools in the toolbox, but it can also kind of feel like this. Um, because I mentioned, you know, if you have root rot and decay, you, know, you really can't do anything about that. You need to be promoting the health of your tree overall. And there are, for some diseases, there are good um, in insect problems, there are good treatments. But for most cases, it's far better to be preventative about that and do what you can to promote the health of your birds and promote your trees instead of trying to kind of play the, the opposite game where you've got a problem and you're trying to address that. So when it comes to managing the health of your forest, I think it's best to try to set the stage for success. And what do I mean by that? Knowing the species that you have there and what the common issues are, knowing your site is going to kind of tell you where things are going for the future and how you can avoid preventable problems. So let's say you have a lot of oak wilt in your area and you've had a lot of problems with that historically. 
it could be something to consider going forward. What would you tell someone, Chris? Uh, yeah, if it's a big one in your area, you know, add diversity in there. Don't if you're going to plant back after trees die, don't just plant back with red oaks because you're just going to be exacerbating the problem or keeping it in there. Yeah. Ash, um, the reason why a lot of cities had such a problem with ash is that prior to ash, they were lined with elm. Elm was an excellent street tree. And so the streets were lined with elm trees, Dutch elm disease came in, killed all those trees. What did we do? We just replanted those areas with ash. And then emerald ash borer comes in and wipes out all those trees. And I think there's a lesson in there about diversity and that could apply both to our woods and our landscape areas in terms of if you're just replacing one thing for another, surely we're going to have something that comes in that wipes out red maple, which is what I think most people are replanting streets with post uh, emerald ash borer, at least in my area. It has been a replacement with red maple, um, but we have lots of insects out there that could arrive and impact red maple in the same way. And so I think kind of giving yourself some recognition there, what are the common issues and how can you avoid preventable problems? Uh, one, avoiding preventable problems. Colorado blue spruce. How does Colorado blue spruce do in this area? Yeah, in my area, it is a temporary tree. You can plant it if you want to be replacing it on a regular rotation. And some people do, they like the look of it. It dies, they plant a new one. You know, if you continue that pattern, but it does not thrive in our environment. It's not native here. It's native to, you know, the name Colorado should indicate that the climate is going to be somewhat different. Um, so you can avoid problems by not kind of using things you know aren't going to do well. And you can do what you want to promote, or you can to promote the health of your trees. So, you know, we can't prevent, uh, there's lots of different native issues around, but a lot of those act opportunistically. So as long as the trees are healthy, they're gonna be able to defend themselves from those. So promoting the health of your trees and limiting damage and wounding, which is great entry points for decay fungi and other problems coming in. And then treatment of trees is really tough. I'm just gonna say that. It's tough to treat trees for insect and disease issues after they're already really stressed. If you're going to do that, the first step, the most important step is diagnostics, making sure you know what the problem is and that the treatment that you're applying is actually going to solve it. If you're spraying an insecticide and the insect isn't actually the issue for your tree, you're kind of just, I mean, you can do it, but there's better ways to spend your money, I think. Um, so you might as well save your money and not do that. Uh, there are effective treatments for some, like if you want to protect trees from emerald ash borer, there are great options for that. For others, not so much. Bacterial leaf scorch, oak wilt, you wanna prevent that infection to begin with, not try to address it once it's already there. Um, now there are some options, but they're just gonna be more limited and have like lower kind of success than you might want. So I think just promoting the health of your tree is really important thinking about the context and what your goal is for that tree because some of the options that are out there may be great for a landscape tree but not really an option in your woods and your kind of different option might have to do with silviculture and how are you going to manage that long term to get the effect that you want so um with that i'm just gonna open it up for any questions and also invite chris to to answer those as well if any come up